welcome and you're free to go ahead right i can add just add one thing so i'm really really happy to have you guys talking today because that's really the spirit of this channel where we want to alternate presentations with a very broad scope typically human on what is going to take place on human with presentations that are really focused on the interest of fang and and then it was very practical stuff so it's really nice to have you today talking addressing exactly the aspect of the channel and to all the audience please reach out to us if you have anything fang related you would like to present in this channel and we'll be really really happy to start accommodating and uh, in an ideal world we would alternate presentations like the one we're going to have today with presentations having a slightly broader scope like next month we will have Roderick Wigo and then the months after we will have Harry Slewin talking about the Earth biogenome and hopefully next year we will have uh, Piero Carninci we are still discussing with him for Phantom and if we find ways of alternating these things this will be absolutely awesome and so I'm really looking forward to hear uh, what, uh, what what you guys have to tell us today thank you very much for for for, for putting up this presentation Thank you. So I will start with my presentation and then you will have two other presentations on what we have been doing, all of us at INRAE, uh, about Fang data. So what I'm going to present uh, is a project we started quite a few years ago and it's not completed yet and actually it's on pause. So this presentation will be either a post-mortem of a failed project or maybe the start of a, a new phase of this project uh, with uh, help from any volunteers that might want to contribute. So I will start with a few acknowledgements to not forget them. So thank you very much to Laura and Sylvain that helped uh, at GenFees, Quentin, Patrice, Philippe and Cédric at CGNAE, and Alexei and Peter that contributed to this project from the EMBL EBI. So FANG, uh, if you don't know, it's an open consortia that uh, means functional annotation of animal genome. And its aim was to improve functional annotation of animal genomes by first standardized core assays, function, uh, core genomics assays and experimental protocols to have a comparable way to generate data and then coordinate and facilitate data sharing and data analysis. So it was a bit like the UNCODE project, but for farm animals. Of course, nowadays it's growing bigger and a new phase of FANG want to do single cell genomics, uh, organoids work, gene editing works, so it's growing bigger. FANG, what? Yeah. So I'm just... <clears throat> I'll just continue and maybe we can have questions at the end. So the Fong has a data portal, so users can contribute to this data portal by providing genomics data and recording a lot of metadata. And when we start this project in 2019, the data portal was quite austere. You have a few identifiers. If you click on the experimental details, you could have a bit more detail about the experiment. And then at the bottom, it was just the unaligned reads, sequencing reads of that uh, experiment. So at the time, there was no processed data available on the Fong data portal. Nowadays, uh, you can contribute your own processed data uh, to the Fong data portal. But as far as I know, there is no uh, uniformly processed uh, data available on the Fong data portal. So if you want to compare um, two experiments that were not uh, uh, done by the same group, uh, most likely the process data file won't be directly comparable. So mm -hmm. we had some funding in 2019 and the funding has ended in 2022 for um, doing some, um, what I wanted to do was encourage FANG data reuse by providing automatic visualizations of all those FANG data. And to do that, we needed to have a uniformly processed uh, of all FANG data, mostly RNA-seq data, chip-seq data, taxic data, and DNA methylation. 
And we also wanted to have a way to automatically process the new funk data that, would, that were submitted uh, all the time. So in the end, we didn't do most of it, but we do have interactive visualization of RNA-seq and, and chip-seq data. So of fung, on fung data, you have many, many experiments or samples, and they have lots of metadata, and the raw reads, unaligned reads are available. And in order to make a visualization, you need to process the, those data. So we did the processing using NextFlow pipelines. For transcriptome, at the time, we didn't use uh, the NF-Core RNA-seq pipeline because there were thousands of transcriptome to process. So we didn't want to keep BAM files or things like that. We just wanted QC reports and count table. And at the time, it was easier to start with a very simple pipeline that was just doing fast QC and then Salmon CD alignment, and that's it, basically. It was doing batch download of the reads, then fast QC, then uh, Salmon alignment, and then removing the reads we have downloaded to make room for the next batch. And at the end of the pipeline, we have uh, quantification tables with uh, genes and the number of reads that map to the genes, or a normalized score. And with this table, we can build a, a correlation matrix. Uh, we compute the Pearson correlation coefficient between, uh, I think it was log 10 of the TPM plus one values and it gives us correlation score, and the highest the correlation score, the closer the experiment looks from one to the other. And with those correlation matri uh, matrices, you can display them as clustered heat map, where samples that have high correlation score are grouped together on, on the tree. And we did that for all fung data before 2021 that was available at the time. It's an example, a screenshot of the um, web application we have, and you select the assay you want. So here we selected RNA-seq, and you select the species you want. Here it was Gallus gallus, the chicken. At the moment, it's only one species per one species. You can't mix different species on the visualization, but we have multi. Uh, well, we have those matrices for all species. And then you can add filters, highlights, or annotation. Uh, here we had a, a colored annotation uh, from the cell type of origin. And you can see on the correlation heat map, uh, samples from the brain cluster together, samples from the liver cluster together, and basically where samples from each tissues are clustering together. So that's really reassuring. Uh, and it ensures that the quality of the data looks really good. Here's another example, and this time it's on pig RNA-seq. And on pigs, there was uh, both uh, classical RNA-seq data uh, from PolyA plus enriched uh, uh, transcript, and there were also small, trans small uh, RNA transcriptomic data. So you can filter to have only the classical transcriptomic data. And you can filter from cell type of interest. Here I selected testis, epididymis, that is close to the testis, and lung. So we have those three tissues, and the annotation uh, match those three tissues. And you can see here in green, you have two uh, testis samples that are highly correlated, one with the other. But the third testis sample looks more closely similar to the lung tissues than to the epididymis or the testis. So it looks like this sample is uh, an outlier, and you might want to remove it if you're doing um, fancy machine learning stuff or things like that. And those kind of visualization are quite uh, uh, good at uh, identifying those outliers. So we don't know why it's an outlier. It might be a true biological difference, but it might also be a, a mistake on our part or a mistake on the sequencing facility, a tube swap or anything, we don't know yet. But still, at the end, this is an outlier. So that was for the transcriptomic part. We also did uh, the ChIP-seq data that was in FUNG. So ChIP-seq is promatine immunoprecipitation followed by high throughput sequencing. And what you do is you 
fragment your chromatine and with an antibody you pull down the <coughs> chromatine uh, that have an epigenetic map or a transcription factor that is recognized by the antibody you're using. And then you sequence the DNA fragments that were pulled down, you align them on the genome, and you have this coverage track along the genome with no coverage uh, in most places and some coverage at uh, localized regions. And at those regions, then you add your, there was the epigenetic mark that was present. So here it's trimethylation of lysine 4 of histone 3. And you can binarize the coverage signal by calling peaks, and it gives you co genome coordinates where the epigenetic mark or the transcription factor was present. And then we compare two peak lists, one with each other. And to do that, you can use correlation coefficients, or you can use, we use a JACAR index. So it's the uh, overlap between the two peak lists uh, divided by the union between the two peak lists. So JACAR index of one uh, gives you two fully overlapping peak lists, and the JACAR index of zero means that the two peak lists has no peaks in common. So with that, we have uh, we can build a similarity matrix and display this similarity matrix as a cluster heat map. So here it was all ChIP-seq data available on the FANG data portal uh, before 2021 for the chicken. And this time the annotation was done with the experiment target, so either CTCF or a few histone modifications. And you can see at the bottom uh, it's mostly H3K27ME3, which is a most more of a repressive mark. On top, it's more uh, active histone marks, and in the middle, in orange, it's CTCF chip -seek. So again, you are mostly uh, satisfied about the quality of the data because it looks like the epigenetic marks are clustering together. Here is another sample from the pig chip -seek, and we filtered for uh, trimethylation of lysine 27 of histone 3. And there was uh, 27 experiments for this histone mark from different tissue. And here the tissue is, is the color code. You can see here that even if FANG metadata is highly curated, there are still a few issues because the trimethylation of lysine 27 of histone 3 corresponds to two labels, one with a capitalized M and one with an uncapitalized M. So that's easy to fix, but that's still a, a, an issue. And then you can see most of the experiments are beautifully clustered together and they subclusterize uh, from the tissue of origins, so all is good. But you have one uh, chip seek sample that have a jacker index of zero with all the other. So again, probably an outlier, maybe a technical uh, issue, or maybe uh, the chip seek is quite good enough, but because we do uniformly processing all the data, maybe the peak calling step was a bit too stringent for that chip seek. Well, anyway, this sample might be an outlier and you might uh, want to be careful before uh, interpreting its results. So what we did we, is we have processed all FANG data before that was available before 2021, either RNA-seq or CHIP-seq. Uh, and with that, we have normalized uh, gene count table, coverage tracks, and uh, peaks coordinates. And we have also quality control reports that uh, we have made available, and then correlation matrices and, and similarity matrices. For some samples, we have both the transcriptome and uh, some chip seek. So we wanted to do some uh, integrative um, plots. And what we did was some epigenetic profiles. So we generated those kind of visualizations where we want to do to know if the epigenetic mark is correlated with uh, gene expression. So we stack all the genes from the non-expressed gene at the bottom to the most expressed genes at the top, according from RNA-seq. And we display uh, epigenetic signal across a feature of interest. Here it's the transcription start site. So at the bottom, you have the transcription start site of unexpressed gene, and at the top, the transcription start sites of highly expressed genes. 
And you can see that there is a beautiful profile of trimethylation of lysine 4 of histone 3 in this sample, which is from the cow, a cerebellum of a cow. And the input, which is uh, before the precipitation step, so it's all negative control, and it's completely flat, so a really nice negative control. So here, this kind of visualization tells you that, yes, this epigenetic mark is positively correlated with transcription level, and both the transcriptomic data and the chip seq data are of really high quality, and you can use them uh, for uh, analyzing them and, and make beautiful uh, biological conclusions. So we made this plot with a package that we have made and that is available on Bioconductor named EpiStack. But you can make this kind of plot with other packages or tools. Uh, there is the Enrich it map on Bioconductor, for example. So once we have these images, what we can do is compare those images one with another. So here on the left, it's a core cheat sec for H3K4ME3 in the hypothalamus. <coughs> and on the left, same, same core, actually, same epigenetic mark, but the different tissue, it was on a, a liver. And here you can see that in both tissue, the epigenetic mark is correlated with uh, gene expression. But it seems that the epigenetic <coughs> mark is more abundant on the hypothalamus sample than on the liver sample. So here you can't really tell if it's a true biological differences between tissue or if it's a technological, a technical difference, either at the chip step or at the sequencing step. But it's intriguing and you might want to dig further. For example, looking at the other chip seek from the hypothalamus or from the liver. And if you see that in many different animals, then you might want to conclude that it's a biological differences. You can also compare different epigenetic marks on the same sample. So on the left here, it's trimethylation of lysine 27 of histone 3. And on the left, acetylation of lysine 27 on it, histone 3. So on the molecular level, on the same mo histone molecule, you can't have both acetylation or methylation. It's either acetylation or methylation. So they are incompatible on the molecular level in principle. And you can see on the left, the acetylation is positively correlated with gene expression. On the right, it's not so clear, but actually in the middle here, you have a bit more of this epigenetic mark. And this mark seems to mark the promoter of uh, lowly expressed genes. And for example, you can find this map on bivalent promoters. So anyway, you can compare epigenetic marks uh, with those kind of images. So where are we now? We have a, a web application that has still many different bugs. So the web application is technically available, but we never advertised it as available. So you can use it at your own risk. And the reason for that is that there are still many issues and bugs in it. So you can uh, click here and view the issue we have uh, identified. And if you identify other issue, please feel uh, raise an issue on the GitHub repository. Sadly, at the moment, nobody is working on this web application anymore. So any contribution to fix those issues is uh, very welcome. The application is deployed at the embassy cloud at the EMBL EBI. So many thanks for them to, for the hosting. And we have all those process data that are sleeping on our uh, web application and we want to submit it as fung analysis files. So we are going to do that uh, hopefully quite soon. So we did use uh, Nextflow pipelines to process the data. The pipeline we use for NACIC is available here, but it's probably best to uh, stop developing it and use better community maintained pipeline. So there was this NF RNA-seq count pipeline, or maybe a wrapper around uh, NF core RNA-seq. Because there are a lot of data to process, the aim is not to keep the aligned reads. So we want to remove BAMs. 
We also want to remove the fast queue files from the disk because uh, otherwise there is no more uh, disk space on our computing uh, server. So we need to say like, we will process 20 RNA-seq data, then clean uh, all the files we don't want, and then download and process the next 20 RNA-seq data and so on. <laughs> Uh, it's actually what we did for ChipSeq. We did a wrapper around NFCore ChipSeq that is available here, and it is doing exactly what as I told. It's downloading a few samples, running uh, NFCore ChipSeq, and then cleaning behind it. Uh, of course, there is room for a lot of improvement on this wrapper because I think at the moment it can only run on our compute facility, uh, GenoTool, so it's not really portable. And we need to be running those pipelines again on uh, all the fun data that has been accumulated from uh, since 2022, and maybe develop a way to do it uh, automatically, or I don't know, or just manually every year or two years. So the first 90% of the project uh, took us 90% of the time, and sadly uh, the next, the last 10% of the project, we also need an, another 90% of the time, but we haven't had uh, all those time left. So it's a bit daunting to to finish to wrap up this project. I think one of the reasons is that the technological stack is a bit too complex for me because we have some next flow which I don't know much about, to be honest. Some R, it's the only part I'm mildly competent. Some Python, the backend of the web application is in, Jung, is in Django, which I don't know anything about. The front end is in Angular, which is a TypeScript, not even JavaScript, but I don't know anything about it. And uh, if the web application is served through Kubernetes, and then everything use uh, Abtainer, Docker, Singularity images. Um, and sadly, we don't have many people working on this project after the end of the funding. I still think there is uh, many, like an opportunity to continue this project because what we have is we have compute hours on our compute server. Uh, Bioinfo Genotool is happy to provide the uh, CPU uh, hours to run all those uh, analyses. The MBL EBI, as far as I know, is okay to continue hosting the web application on all the process data. And the need is still here, is that raw reads are still accumulating on the fun data portal. And as far as I know, nobody is processing them uniformly and rendering them available to the community. So the need is still here. So maybe we can revive this project with uh, motivated volunteers. So that's it for me. I can take a few questions. Then we can move on to Servan and uh, Sandy presentation. And if you want, at the end, we can go through the web application uh, together if there's still some time. Perfect. Thank you. So, I'm not sure, to be honest. So it's not published. The web application is available, but not advertised as available. So only a few people know about it because there's a lot of issue. It can't be, it can't be used uh, well, it can't be advertised as a usable web application at the moment unless we resolve quite a lot of issues. Mm. But and is it then by the yep. time we fix those, we only have data up to 2021. Yeah. So but publishing that in 2025 or 2026, we only have data up to 2021. It's not worth it yeah, well, for a publication. So either we reprocess all funk data or we give up. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah. Don't you oh. think uh, it's difficult for the user of this tool to reprocess this uh, data by themselves? Yeah, the tool by itself can have a, an interest, right? If mm -hmm. people are willing to well, take over. Yeah, I, I don't want to be the one no. that is reprocessing all the data. Yeah. I just need uniformly processed files to generate the visualizations. Yeah. 
and that's quite fast and not uh, that it didn't require a lot of computing uh, hours. Someone else could. Uh... So yeah, if we have someone able to uniformly process all the data, I would be really happy. I think like Remap from Marseille, they reprocess all the available chipsic data, but only for human, mouse, Arabidopsis, and a few other species, and not mm -hmm. the fang species yet. So maybe we, we can ask the Remap guy to reprocess the chipsic mm -hmm. for us. And it's the same for Recount for RNA-seq data. Uh, there was this group that was reprocessing all the available uh, RNA-seq data. But again, it was only human and mouse. So maybe we can ask them to incorporate the fang species. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how do you see this? Do you see this as uh, something meant to become a central hub that will be developed by a community or by a group? Or do you see, do you see it becoming a tool that specific groups could deploy in-house to explore their own data and possibly compare their own data with existing data. In which case, the issue is not so much the data. The issue is uh, packaging all of that stuff so that it can be deployed. And even the web server can be deployed internally. I'm receiving an increasing number of, uh, of, of, uh, of publication in, in NowGAD <laughs> where this is web-based, yeah, which I don't like, but the web comes along with a source code and everything so that users can deploy it locally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, so the idea was it to enrich the Fong data portal, mm -hmm. but of course everything is open source and hopefully uh, quite portable enough and flexible enough so that it can use uh, data from other projects. Because from that point of view, I would really encourage you to publish this as a an analytic framework because mm. i think this could be of interest to, to quite a few people beyond fang I and mean, including fang but also beyond fang and of course because it provides a, a, a harmonization of the data then it means that uh, data harmonized through this combination of tools could be centralized somewhere or could be virtually consolidated by being put on the cloud or this kind of things I think it's it's got it's got that will be quite a nice development. Yes, I agree. But <laughs> we need people to do that. <laughs> or volunteers. So, uh, or so to, to, uh, my understanding what so and that's precisely what this channel is all about. So of course anybody interested should reach out to you. And also I understand you're trying to get extra money on that stuff. This is this is hopefully the seed of a new project you're applying for. Yeah. Uh-huh. Very nice. Yeah. It will be nice uh, to have a community gathering to, to develop this because at least for Fong, the need is here. And code, you have this Definitely. magnificent data portal yeah. where all the data is reprocessed every two years and all the process files are available and archived and you have QC for everything. And on Fong, on Fong, you just have the raw reads, but the data is here. Uh -huh. There is just this need to have it uniformly processed and presented in a, a nice way to encourage data reuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's something that could, you know, we're going to have uh, Harry Sluin uh, in, uh, in, in two months talking about the Earth biogenome. Mm -hmm. And... I believe that uh, one of the important aspects of the Earth biogenome will be to be able to contrast existing model species because effectively, you know, the, the, the farm animal species are almost model species thanks to the amount of data gathered on these species and to contrast these things with the species uh, analyzed through the Earth biogenome, which will, of course, some of them Will probably come along with quite a bit of data, I suppose primate, and others with less data. But it will be nice to have some kind of integration. Probably you will want to see uh, 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 wild pigs, you know, all, 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 all the genus of the pigs, the data to be somehow integrated with this. And so maybe the Earth biogenome could provide some support for this kind of a framework. Yeah. Something that 
may be interesting to discuss with Harris. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so Could it we... seems like everyone has found its way back. So Great. maybe we can continue. Yeah. Okay. Sarah, do you want to go through yeah. your presentation? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, so thank you for listening to me. Um, so I know this session is about um, automatic visualization of uh, animal genomics data within FANG. And while this is definitely about uh, visualization of animal genomics data, it started outside of FANG, uh, but it's getting there. And it's also started at uh, not so much automated, but uh, again, we are getting there. So it's kind of a process. So it's a um, database that's called FishMe RNA. So it's a very community-specific uh, thing because it's about uh, fish uh, microRNAs. Uh, but I think it's an uh, interesting sh showcase of how we can um, exploit the data we make to make it more easy to access for biologists. Um, so just so we can be on the same page uh, about microRNAs, this is the, the usual um, slide to remind what they are. So they, for animal genomes, there are uh, short non-coning RNAs, around 22 base pairs. And they are useful for the genomic regulation because they can target specific uh, coding genes and repress their uh, expression. And when we are working with them uh, and trying to annotate them, uh, we are interested in this uh, secondary structure with this uh, hairpin-like um, form. And what we try to annotate on genomes usually is this part, so the hairpin, uh, which is a, this uh, bigger uh, loop, and also the actual functional part, which is a major uh, part, and there are two strands that are um, uh, stuck together, and uh, also the seed region, which is uh, uh, what uh, allows the, the, the microRNA to target a particular gene. So because these genes are uh, very short, they are, well, even if they are short, they are not very easy to annotate because it's sometimes difficult to accurately uh, map them because you can, by chance, align them somewhere else in the genome, and they are uh, actually difficult to annotate and quantify. So to work with them, uh, people usually use uh, one database, which is called MiaBase, which is really the, the go-to uh, website when you are um, working on microRNAs. Uh, but it has a few drawbacks. Uh, first of them, it's that the, the last update was in 2019, which is uh, not so recent and it was not a very big update. And the second uh, thing is that it's very uneven in terms both of the quantity and the quality of the sequences that are uh, in there. So on this uh, picture, I uh, got the number of genes annotated for all the fish species in Mirbase plus uh, the human genome. And you can see that, of course, for uh, human, you have uh, 2,000 sequences. And for the fish, you have, uh, but it's expected you have uh, much uh, less uh, sequences. And uh, actually, when I did this uh, picture, I was surprised because I expected uh, this one, Daniel Rayo, which is a zero fish, to be uh, the, the, the most annotated uh, sequence because it's, you know, it's a model species for a fish. And the thing is, it's actually this one, which is a tilapia, for those who know. And um, the thing is, it's uh, all these uh, 800 sequences are coming from a single paper on, in a single tissue uh, that were um, analyzed with a, a, a rather peculiar workflow, which is not very standard. So it shows that this database is not very trustworthy if you, if you want to um, analyze the, the whole microRNA uh, repertoires in different species uh, that are not model species. And of course, for the uh, fish community, some species that are very important in terms of um, agro, uh, agronomy are also missing, like the trout, for instance, uh, which is close to the salmon, but uh, still a different species. So it's not included in this database. So that's why we came at some point uh, to the idea of developing this uh, fish-focused uh, database for microRNAs. 
which is called FishMe RNA. So what we wanted to do was to have a, a sort of unified pipeline to both annotate and quantify uh, microRNAs in a range of uh, fish species. And to do that, so we have a, a process in two steps, which is first to use an existing uh, software called POST uh, that uh, helps to identify with a rather low uh, rate of false positive uh, mature sequences on the genome. And then we have a very tedious a step of manual curation to uh, turn these predictions into actual genes that we can trust. And it's done <coughs> by using the um, synteny conservation across uh, uh, fish lineages. So we check that for a given microRNA prediction in different species, we have the same uh, autologs that are on both sides of the gene. So it was um, by hand and was uh, very time consuming and also not the best for, uh, you know, reproducible sciences and stuff like that. And the other goal was to um, supply all this information in the database with as much information as we could find, um, like uh, ontology and uh, external references and also quantification data, but I, I'm going to show you that. So, um, this is a, a screenshot for from the website as of today, and we can you can see uh, that we have uh, so far twelve fish species that we worked with, and uh, you can see on this uh, plot in blue you have the numbers of microRNA genes that are annotated for each species, and in red the number of mature sequences, so you know the the uh, strands uh, uh, for each hairpin. So you can see that we have uh, like a couple hundred, uh, yeah, a couple hundred uh, sequences for each species, which is in the range of what we expect. Um, just funny to see uh, this guy, which is a, a special case for uh, this MIR 430, which is a very funky gene uh, that is actually repeated in many, many, uh, like dozens of copies in a very particular spot. So they are very tricky to annotate. So they have their, their own category in this uh, plot. And um, what else? Uh, yeah, that's it. So yeah, so 12 species. And you can see that the last update was in uh, September last year. Uh, but I'm going to show you how we are trying to extend this database um, in, in collaboration with the um, Aquafang project. But before, I'm going to show you the, the features of the website, which was uh, done by my colleague Philippe Bardou uh, here at INRAE uh, in Toulouse. And it's a very nice website and very uh, easy to use. And the main uh, entry point is, is this uh, table. And in the upper part, you can, uh, you know, select the sequence you want to work with so by species or by name, or you can blast the sequence that you like. And then you get in the bottom part, uh, all the sequence that you wanted to get. And of course, you can export it and, uh, you know, as a biologist want to do, uh, put it into Excel and do whatever you want uh, with them after that. Uh, so it's very well done and very nice. But also for each sequence, if you click on this uh, icon, you can get for each gene some identity card with every uh, feature that you, everything you want to know about each gene. So first you get the, the picture of the fish, which is very important because, uh, you know, it's nice to to see the actual fish. And you get, of course, the uh, uh, sequence for the hairpin and the mature when available. And also some more uh, fish specific information like the uh, ontology with the latest common ancestor for all these uh, species we are working with. And if the genes are clustered together, you have this information and you have also some references with uh, other databases, including uh, ZFIN, which is a, a zebrafish specific uh, database. So again, it's quite useful. And um, as I said, we also wanted to uh, put in this database some expression information because we had all these uh, small RNA-seq datasets that we processed uh, in batch 
to to do the annotation, but we can also use uh, the expression values. So one kind of view that you can get, but uh, also others, is that you can select a gene, for instance, this one, the MIA202 for the zebrafish, and you can see in each of those tissues where it's expressed and which one of the strands uh, is expressed. And for this particular uh, gene, it's known that it's linked to um, reproductory organs, so it's very normal to uh, find it only in these two uh, tissues. And it's also expected that only one of the two measures is expressed because it's an actual uh, functional form, the other one is uh, degraded. Um, okay, so that's everything for the, the main features of the database. And now, now I'm coming to um, how we got to work with uh, Aquafung, and so uh, yeah, how this became some fun-related work. Um, so we published uh, this in 2022, and then we went uh, in contact with Aquafung because they had uh, a bunch of small RNSEC datasets, actually 400 of them for six species and they didn't really know what to do with them. And on the other side, we wanted to extend the database with new species. So we started to work with them. And that there were two goals. Um, first one was to reduce this step of manual curation, manual prediction of the microRNA genes, which was uh, very time consuming. And the other one was at the same time to use what we did for the previous species of fish me RNAs and to use this information to make the annotation of new species easier. So we ended up with this uh, very simple mm -hmm. uh, pipeline. So we have small RNA data that we still process with uh, this tool called POST that will predict uh, mature sequences on the genome. And then we have a, a small uh, pipeline called MIRTI uh, that will uh, use these predictions and also the existing uh, annotations that are already in FishMe RNA to uh, predict a set of uh, automated, uh, automatically annotated uh, microRNA genes. And for that, it's doing the same thing that we were doing before uh, manually. So it's looking at the uh, neighboring of those uh, predictions and looking if the uh, synteny is conserved uh, between all the uh, fish me RNA species. And because it's gene annotation, if you want to do the things well, you still have to do some uh, manual adjustments and some manual curation to check that everything is fine. Especially uh, to, to name macro-RNAs, it's kind of an art because you have to add many suffixes depending on the genome duplication and gene duplication, so it's a bit tricky. But hopefully then the new annotation can go back to FishMe RNA and if you have a new species uh, coming, you can annotate it with one more species. Um, so here is the kind of result we got for the truth, for instance. So we had uh, about 50 samples in uh, a range of tissues and development stages. And we predicted about 700 uh, microRNA genes, which is much more than when you, we, we saw earlier, which is normal, I'll explain later. But the nice thing is that you can see for each of those genes, uh, which other fish meal RNA species are supporting it uh, in terms of synteny. And that's what you can see on this graph. So you can see that, for some instance, if you take uh, the umbra, which is uh, the most related species to the uh, truth, you have more, like, more than 300 uh, predictions that are uh, consistent with uh, the umbra in terms of synteny, uh, which is uh, nice. So it's kind of a proxy both for the uh, quality annotation and also the relatedness between the two species. And you can also see it like this and show for each prediction the number of fish RNA species that are supporting it. And you can see that the, the max is seven species. But uh, overall, it shows that you, you can't use only one species. And it's uh, because we are using uh, uh, many species that you, we can reach uh, high confidence annotation for these uh, genes. So the more fish RNA grows, the more we can um, put more data and uh, 
uh, build more reliable annotations. And uh, so as I told earlier, we had uh, 700 genes, which is a lot, but this is actually very normal because uh, the truth um, underwent uh, a very recent uh, genome duplication uh, compared to the other uh, species. And uh, because we have this information in fish RNA, we can go back to the autolog for the last common ancestor for uh, all these fishes. And you can see that for each autolog, for many genes, you have actually two copies on the uh, true genome, which is uh, totally sound and uh, totally expected. And also only like 40 of them are retained only in one copy. So it was a nice result. And we are going to uh, go uh, deeper into that also by including the salmon uh, annotation we, uh, which went into the same 4R duplication. Okay, uh, so oops, what we still have to do uh, is to uh, finalize the annotation for this uh, six species. We are actually almost done, only the, the salmon is done to is uh, left. And then we will uh, publish a new update for fish RNA with this new uh, six species and also a couple more from other sources. And uh, we believe it will be for the community, the fish community, which is rather big, it will be a very uh, interesting resource um, on both, uh, on, on two, two parts. Uh, first one is uh, what we uh, personally are more interested in is the evolution of microRNA repertoires, especially with this uh, genome duplication, which gen genes were retained and which weren't. But it will also be a resource, uh, for instance, because we will be uh, providing quantification for all these new uh, sequences. Because in Aquafung, they did um, a number of experiments testing different phenotypes, and we will be able to provide quantification for all the sequences in those uh, experiments, so it will be uh, useful, hopefully. And uh, now I think I'm done. And um, I'm uh, thanking my, my colleagues that were the more, more involved in this project, so Julien Bob in Bren in Inrae. Uh, who was uh, basically the PI for this project, and Philippe Bardou, who did uh, most of the development of the website, which is very nice, and Thomas Devigne in the uh, University of Oregon, which, who is uh, our fish uh, microRNA expert, and he also did the heavy lifting with the uh, manual curation of all these sequences, so uh, many thanks to him. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sabine. It was very interesting. Um, I would suggest in the interest of time to have a handover now to Sandrine and then have a mm. question yeah. session That's afterwards. Okay. I stop sharing. I can share. Mm. I'm sorry, but I can't share my screen. We did see something just now. Okay. Okay. So can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so there are no much time left, so I try to be quick. Um, uh, so a few words about the GIGA, oops, the first slide, the GIGA uh, web application for Gallus Enriched Gene Annotation, uh, developed in collaboration with uh, Fabien Degales and Philippe Barnouf from uh, INRAE and uh, CGNAE uh, and uh, Institut Agro. So in introduction, uh, very quickly, we developed this tool to meet the needs of some biologists working uh, with chicken uh, and who wish to integrate gene model from WIFSIC and Ensemble and different type of information in the same tool. Uh, so uh, we will use this tool 
uh, in some projects um, with this uh, biologist, uh, as for example uh, in the Geronimo uh, European Geno Geronimo uh, project. So, uh, so Giga is a website um, that you can find at this uh, link that provides various existing or new uh, genomic and functional information in chicken uh, related to the gene atlas that we have recently enriched in gene. And uh, this atlas uh, is combined with an expression atlas for 47 uh, tissues that we have generated by analyzing more than 1,400 RNA-seq samples from SRA or ENR. And uh, about the gene uh, atlas, we uh, obtain uh, this atlas by gathering uh, six databases uh, here, including the two reference uh, databases with SIG and Ensemble, and other, uh, four other resources, including um, uh, resources from a FANG project, like this one. And uh, by this way, we have increased the number of genes, in particular uh, the long encoding RNA genes, uh, as shown here. Um, in comparison to the numbers uh, present in the WIFSIC and Ensemble uh, annotation. Can put the pointer laser, okay. And about the tissue atlas, uh, it gives the possibility to analyze um, expression across 47 tissues, so quite a lot of tissues. And, uh, and um, as well, uh, within a specific tissue, since uh, 36 uh, tissues uh, have um, enough uh, samples to do that. And such a tissue atlas uh, as not equivalent uh, today in chicken, in particular in uh, the expression atlas, the reference expression atlas from uh, EBI-MBL. So, um, Next slide. Uh, so how to use GIGA? Um, GIGA offer, offer in, the, uh, in the Explore menu here, uh, an interactive table is quite similar to the tool that uh, Servan has presented uh, just before. So uh, it's an interactive table that display uh, gene information in columns here. Um, and this information can be selected among more than 160 gene features uh, via this module, show height columns. And uh, these features can be genomic information, as shown here. Uh, for example, they can be gene ID equivalence, equivalence between WIFSIC and Ensemble, or genomic configuration between two neighboring uh, genes. Uh, obtained by finance uh, tool. And they can be also functional information, like, for example, gene ontology terms or gene expression across the uh, 47 tissues. And about the genes here, uh, the genes can be filtered by the user, uh, the user by different ways through these modules, these three modules. So the first one, the search module, uh, filters genes according to one or several genomic and or functional information. And uh, uh, the uh, gene selection can be also uh, related to a genomic region uh, defined here, like, uh, for example, a QTL region. Or uh, finally, the gene selection can be done here by um, according to a, an expression filter uh, like, for example, uh, tissue uh, specificity. Oop. And uh, in this Explore menu, you have a last panel uh, called Interactive Graphical View. And this uh, panel provides plots to explore expression or co-expression patterns in chicken across tissue, within a specific tissue, or by age or by sex as well. Uh, it uh, provides also the um, plot to explore co-expression between chicken and human for the autologous genes, in particular for the protein coding genes. And um, 
in addition to this panel in the explore menu, you have an interactive viewer, a classical interactive viewer to visualize the gene models according to the six uh, resources used for generated uh, for generating uh, the gene uh, enriched atlas. Oops. So just to finish this short uh, presentation, um, a case, uh, let's go to a case study here on one specific gene, uh, TBX5, just to illustrate a potential application of GIGA. So the expression profile across uh, the 47 tissue here, uh, combined with the gene ontology term analysis, um, reveals here that TBX5 plays a functional role in earth. It's uh, uh, very clear. And uh, it's consistent with the literature. Moreover, genomic configuration analysis by Financy uh, and uh, the orthologous gene analysis um, reveals also that um, a long encoding RNA uh, is in antisense orientation with this uh, protein coding genes TBX5. And we can see that this configuration is conserved in both humans and uh, mice. So this result uh, suggests that these two genes share a common uh, functional role in heart. So to go further to support this hypothesis, it's possible to do other analysis with GIGA. <coughs> so GIGA shows in one click, uh, in, in, sorry, in a single click, uh, that the um, antisense long encoding RNA is specifically expressed in the heart when we analyze uh, expression across the 47 tissues as shown uh, in, uh, with uh, TBX5. Uh, in addition, GIGA here reveals that the two genes are co-expressed. Here you have the long encoding RNA and here the TBX5 are co-expressed in the heart using the 43 samples of uh, three projects uh, available in the database. This and the expression analysis by age showed that the both genes are more expressed in the embryo stages here than in the adult uh, stages. So, in conclusion of this uh, case study, um, GIGA allows to establish in just a few clicks interesting links between uh, long encoding and enfin, between the the TBX5 uh, gene with uh, its uh, long encoding RNA. And uh, we have uh, other case studies uh, reported in the paper associated to this uh, tool uh, and recently uh, published in uh, uh, genomic and bioinformatics. So that's uh, it, I think. It was a bit uh, quick, but uh, because of the time, so I have, I have finished. If you have very, some questions, very, very good choice as a journal, oh, if you. I may say. Very, very yeah, good yeah. choice. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, then we have uh, still maybe five minutes for questions to any of our speakers. Hi. I have a question maybe for, for Sandrine. So this is great. This is a great resource. And the question and the question that came out quite a lot in both right in general is uh, really the long-term sustainability of all of these uh, resources because uh, it's very clear that uh, data will keep flowing in. Uh, 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 sequencing will get cheaper and cheaper. And, and so uh, it will also get... Uh, uh, more and more resolved. I don't think we are yet much into single cell sequencing, but we, we you know, we, we are closing the gap as time goes. And so how, how do you see, uh, I know that this is all constrained with uh, 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 resources that have to be carried over and are not. And so, uh, but this being said, is a tool or uh, the series of visualizations that you have presented ready to accommodate new data, how much work will be involved in uh, uh, 
do, will you need re-engineering to 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 be able to accommodate a constant data flow, or or, or is it something that will require restarting from scratch? Um, we have decided to to update the these resources at each um, update of uh, genome assembly only. Uh -huh. Uh, but we know that um, uh, it's moving. <laughs> yes, the resources uh, is growing. Uh, uh, the research uh, goes fast. But uh, during three, four years, I think it uh, can be uh, very useful. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we'll see. So, because now cool. the research uh, goes very fast. So yeah. yeah. Because one of the one of the things we are now exploring a lot with Nextflow is prompt engineering. So the last pipelines we have done, one of our goal, one of our project over the next few months will be to try to recreate this pipeline using prompt engineering with ChatGPT and 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 actually comparing Copilot, ChatGPT, and all these kind of things. And I believe that in not too distant future. A resource like this one may be uh, updated using these resources, you know, using ChatGPT or something similar, where you may use prompt engineering to expand the database, to integrate novel. Is it something you've, you, you've started exploring or you, you, you've started brainstorming on how to do it? Well, no, we, we didn't. Um, uh -huh. We haven't uh, thought about, uh, about this kind of... Uh, of way to to update to update this this resource, but because uh, I think it's worth exploring because as much as uh, you don't want ChatGPT to create all that stuff from scratch because it will take too many low level decisions that 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 may not be the right one for you. If you provide it with the right skeleton which you have already, it's probably not that complicated and not that much work to to have it able to scoop existing data or to 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 increase the number of entry channel you know everything that can be sort of programmatically duplicated is something that that will be very amendable i think to to to, to this kind of uh, of uh, prompt engineering or what they call prompt engineering these days and i understand the new uh, the new model they 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 were saying that the new models in open ai they run tests when they hire engineers and their new model the strawberry is actually outperforming all of the engineer, which is raising the issue of not knowing exactly who is generating the next iteration of ChatGPT people <laughs> or models. Do we, Do we have, have any, any other questions? Other question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, just uh, a comment uh, about this idea. It's a, uh, it's a very nice, uh, a, a nice idea, and I think it's very relevant. The the the, the limitation, and maybe this will be uh, to us. I mean, this will be something we will have to think about uh, for the the future projects of this kind. The limitation is that, of course, everything that can be automatized who can benefit from this uh, engineering process. But for all the parts that need manual annotation and manual curation, there will still be a yeah, need for, for heavy manual work. And so, of course, uh, the more automatic we can build the, the, well, the future workflows, the, the easier it will be to maintain and, and, and yeah. So it's a good, it's a, it's a very important discussion. And so uh, my take on this is that we are shifting from a situation where we were doing stuff to a situation where we will have to supervise that the stuff we wanted to be done has been done properly. And annotation is a good example because uh, it's a typical situation where you can create your benchmark and you can ask if your benchmarks have been satisfyingly uh, achieved by the machine. Your problem in that case is that you want, of course, to be sure that the annotation you're trying to recreate was not part of the training. So you have to be 
the data leakage is going to be a bit of an issue. In our case, for instance, uh, uh, the project we are working on, because we have uh, we have these three NF core pipelines we are developing, we have the protein fold, we have the differential abundance, and we have the MSA. So we have the pipeline, we, we are making them by hand, and we can therefore have an objective benchmark as to whether we were able to recreate the pipelines using prompt engineering. And what we are going to work on over the next months is uh, defining some metrics of success, because you cannot simply do a diff and say, well, if it's not totally identical, then it's not the right pipeline. And so you have to decide at which level you're happy. For instance, if the pipeline is able to generate multiple sequence alignments, great. But if the pi pipeline does not work entirely, how do you tell whether you're going the right direction or not? And probably we are going to compare modules and we are going to ask next flow, you know, we are going to ask modules to be implemented. There's a little bit of a problem with next flow, or there was, because uh, initially, uh, because there were two versions of next flow and that confused a little bit chat GPT at some point. And so, but I understand this is being fixed and new, uh, LLM are being trained for next flow, so that 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 that's something we'll be in a position to explore. That's quite that's quite an exciting development.